The American Quilt Study Group presents Quilts in a Material World, a series of short presentations exploring material culture studies. This is episode three, Finding the Story Within, presented by Mia Clift. Cybersecurity leader by day and quilter, quilt historian, and collector by night, Mia Clift has been thoroughly down the rabbit hole of all things quilty for over 12 years. A member of the American Quilt Study Group, avid collector and student of antique quilts and textiles, Mia is passionate about helping folks find the story within their own quilts and to keep the hobby of quilting alive. She resides in St. Paul, Minnesota, is the moderator of Treadle On, a people-powered sewing machine group, and presents on quilt history, feed sacks, hand quilting, antique sewing machines, and more to quilt guilds, quilt shows, and living history organizations around the country. You can follow Mia at History by Hand on Facebook. Hello, everyone. And today we're going to be talking about finding the story within. As stated earlier, I am Mia Clift. And you can find me at History by Hand on Facebook or at info at patchesoftime.com. We all love a good story, whether it's, you know, reading a bedtime story to our our kids or our nephews. Uh, Even in this picture, you can be like, why is that inflatable bed there in the background? Fun fact, it was for that little truck that's down in the corner. But still, we all love a good story. It's what draws us into television, to movies, to podcasts, to the work we do, to the people that we engage with. And even in quilts, we can find those stories. Anything in material culture has a story. So from the moment we're born, we engage in an ongoing and increasingly intensive interaction with the environments that are to varying degrees natural and human-made. They're an environment that we have shaped and in turn have shaped us. And yet, in many ways, we've barely begun to study its role in our lives. So um, this author of Material Cultures, Material Minds, she actually wrote this in her in her book. And it's true. Everything around us shapes who we are. It shapes our lives. It tells us stories. It, it absorbs our stories. And that's what we're looking for today. And that's what we're talking about today is that quilts they even have a story and it does help shape our environment just as much as anything natural. Here we can see one that in the every quilt has a story to slide, a uh, really unique quilt. And, you know, the question is how did, how did this get made? Where are we coming from? Where did it get made? All of these stories that are within these quilts that we can discover if we just take a look. So, for example, the quilt on the left was made 51, or the quilt on the right, I'm sorry, the quilt on the right was made 51 years ago for the wedding of these two people on the left. That's my parents. My Aunt Becky made it for them, and it sat for years. Uh, I can remember it being in the house, but I couldn't use it. It was kept because it was a, a, a historical item for my family. But uh, it just kind of sat in the basement for a really long time. And it wasn't until Aunt Becky would later teach me to quilt years and years later that I learned to appreciate it. And then it even got shown at Houston. So we even continued the story even after it was made and after it was gifted. And, and, And the story continues today in how Aunt Becky still quilts and how I still quilt. So how do we find these stories? And I think you've seen in just looking at a couple of slides here, we might find the stories through we know when it was made or how it was made or when it was given to us and who it was made by. Um, We can look at different aspects of the quilt. We can even tell based off of its construction techniques, its fabrics and more. This quilt on the right, again, is another one that says Youth Group 74 in the center. This was made at Harmony Church of the Brethren in Myersville, Maryland in 1974 by their youth group and given to my grandmother who was part of uh, the uh, education team for that youth group and she had just had a stroke. So that was a gift to her. But all of the people uh, on this um, quilt are people that I know in my community and about half of them I'm related to. So that story continues on through me because I knew these people and I knew the quilt and why it was made. 
One of the first things that we can do and we can look at when we talk about quilting is the quilt patterns that are used to make the quilt. This is some of the, the biggest pieces of ephemera and great ways to track down the origins of a quilt or, or where they got the idea for the quilt. And you can see sometimes it's as simple as pulling a, a newspaper uh, clipping from the Kansas City Star or a mail order pattern from uh, any number of different companies that made mail order catalogs or even today. You can order them from Connecting Threads or even uh, Missouri Star. While it's moved from mail order to internet ordering, it still comes in the mail. Um, Pre-cut pieces like you see down in the picture. People draw their own patterns so that they can color them in and figure out how they want to lay them out. Or even in art, we see a lot of art quilts happening where people are taking inspiration from things like Van Gogh's Starry Night to photography, pictures that they've taken on their own and, and applied quilting techniques and, and methodology to them. So we can really look at the pattern and kind of see where the um, where the producer was coming from, why they chose to do these things, where they got the inspiration, and, and where they went with it afterwards. It's really kind of fun. So here's a pattern story for you. So I picked up the quilt on the left in Minnesota uh, at an antique sale, and uh, it was a really unique pattern. I It took me a little while to figure out what the actual pattern was, and it wasn't until I had worked with uh, posting to a group on Facebook uh, with people from the American Quilt Study Group that someone came back and said it was made by Hubert Vermeeren. The pattern was made by Hubert Vermeeren and it was called the Windmill Star Quilt and I was given this clipping. Hubert Vermeeren was a designer out of Iowa who was a mathematician and he created very complicated patterns. To wit, it's very rare to see one of his patterns completed because of the complexity. And you can see that complexity in this piece where you have the center windmill square but then the corner pieces end up turning into eight pointed stars or Le Moyne stars, as we call them, in the corners of the blocks to create a secondary pattern within that quilt. That's a more complicated piece than we typically see, especially out of a, a, a cut and play kind of um, pattern. And so it's really unique to see the piece. It's unique to see how it's assembled and put together. And it just ends up having this cool connection to this very unique pattern designer and someone who actually tried one of his pieces and made a success. Textiles are a great way to tell a story about a quilt. Um, between uh, our romanticism of different fabrics and different prints and different colors to understanding that every single textile has a story behind it, how it was made, how it developed, the popularity of it. Uh, even eras and the popularity and why they became popular at different points as well. So here we have three very differing and striking pieces of textile in front of you. You have a stack of feed sacks on the left and we have this romanticism with feed sacks and how uh, generations were making quilts and clothing and other things out of them. This centerpiece is all fabrics from the turn of the 18th century into the 19th century. It's from a quilt that's dated 1816. And you can see the uniqueness of the colorings, the uniqueness of the placement, even down in the corner where the, uh, the fabric is actually being eaten away by the mordants that were made in the, or that were used in the dyes to make these uh, prints. And then on the right, we even have these pre-cut kits these pre-cut blocks that you could mail order, going back to the mail order patterns, uh, and that way you didn't have to cut these pieces, you didn't have to have the variety of fabric, you could just order these little packets, um, and then you'd have your pre-cut pre kit to make your quilt and be able to work on it accordingly. We can also tell a time period. We can also tell some interesting stories. So this is a fun textile tale. So the quilt on the right is a quilt in my collection. Each one of the little diamonds to make these stars is about two inches long, maybe a little less. But as I take a piece, I tend to hang it up, um, as you can see in the picture, and I photograph as, as many of the fabrics as I can. Well, getting into it, I found these unique fabrics, the one with uh, a coat on it, and then the one with the little, um, the, the wording there in the center. Both of those are pieces of the same fabric that were cut into tiny, tiny pieces. And it turns out they were for the man in the picture 
Horace Greeley during his 1872 presidential campaign. Now, one, how cool is it that somebody was printing fabric for a presidential campaign in 1872? Uh, two, interesting that it was for Horace Greeley because uh, he ended up losing to to Grant. But also, it it was his byline. It says, what I know about is the wording on the strip. And then his little coat, which he's wearing in the picture, which is kind of cool. Um, another part of the same quilt that is fascinating is this tealy turquoisey green that you can see in the third picture. And that is a centennial fabric. It was uh, that green, that centennial green was only made around 1876. So that actually tells us when this quilt was made. In addition to all of the other fabrics around it, we know that it had to have been made after 1876. So this woman had all of these fabrics or this maker. We don't even know that it was a woman per se. It's likely. But this maker had all of these little tiny scraps and was able to turn that into this amazing piece. The other amazing thing about it is that she tied it at every point. So every half inch or inch, there's a tie at every corner. So she had a lot of time on her hands and had a lot of scraps. But it's just one of those really fascinating stories that you just get dug into if you just take a closer look at some of the textiles. Quilting designs are another one that's near and dear to my heart. Um, I'm a hand quilter and I love quilting. So I love seeing the different quilting designs or motifs. And you can really see a lot. You can definitely tell age based on the amount of quilting uh, on the detail in within it. Um, you can see all these different things like uh in the left one you can see the tulip and then the little four point uh quatrefoils um, you can see a cross hatch you can see some feathering and then even on the um right piece which is a different piece you can see some of the feather circle up in the one corner but then you also see that it's almost like a fiddlehead fern and it's just this really long swirly line and this spiral and it's just so intricate and ornate and beautiful where did she get the inspiration for that? What made her decide to put that in that spot? There's a whole other piece and, and story there about where did she get the idea? Where did she get that, that design from? Was it something that she had seen regularly? Or was it something that was passed down? Was it made in tin? You know, how do we, how do we find these things? How do we see the commonalities in them? And, and what are they trying to convey in the quilting designs as well? Sometimes even in certain quilting designs, even if they're doing something simple, they may do something more neat. So this quilt uh, is part of my collection as well. It's a uh, very unique nine patch uh, done on point. So you have all this massive white space, but she did mostly uh, cross hatch. So she was just going and making a grid, except for one spot on the left-hand side where she put her name and the date. So Mary, I haven't been able to figure out the name because the, the, the fabric is faded or the, the thread has faded, but uh, she dated it April 15th, 1846. So that gives us a time. Uh, and if we figure out her name, we could even potentially have a place and some history about the individual who made the quilt. And that's a really cool thing because then you can really learn more about the time and place that that person lived. Maybe even figure out how she had all these fabrics to see where she was class wise, or, you know, maybe it even turns out she was a milliner and she had all of this easily available to her. She was a shop owner. Her husband was a merchant. There's so many different ways that could go. And that's the joy of, of looking deeper. And we see a lot of um, initials. We see dates and quilts a lot that really does help to tell the story and, and kind of dig a little deeper into that rabbit hole. Even in modern day, we find fun little things in quilts, um, even with the advent of modern quilting. Now I am a hand quilter, but one of the things I've started doing personally is uh, during the pandemic, I picked up a cookie cutter that is uh, a plague doctor. And I now put a plague doctor on all my quilts. So a hundred years from now, somebody could see this video and could have one of my quilts in their collection and be like, oh, I have the plague doctor in my collection. That's pretty cool. So I am contributing to the story through quilting design, and that makes me happy. Colors. Colors can indicate regions. They can indicate trends in fabrics. Uh, they can also give you a time frame on when the 
the quilt was made. Uh, the three below are all Pennsylvania quilts. And we know that because of the, the common colors of those eras. Uh, there's a lot of books and information on how uh, Pennsylvania Dutch specifically or Pennsylvania German quilters used only a set routine of colors. They really like their pinks, their yellows, and their greens, uh, as you can see, and blue. Um, and then uh, as an inside joke to a friend who has taught me a lot about German quilts, she tends to talk about a nice German or a nice brown being German indicative in Pennsylvania uh, on the back of a quilt. So a nice brown back is what she says. She says it pretty commonly. So uh, there's a nice brown back to that middle quilt. So again, just showing that it's kind of a Pennsylvania German thing, but also like seeing the change in pinks from uh, like double pinks, as we call them, or cinnamon pinks, as some people call them, where they start off kind of light and get to a more reddish hue so like the the red on the right or the double pink on the right is more of that like big red gum kind of color not shows it's later in the century than the earlier more softer pinks of the early to mid 19th century even moving from these kind of colors into more of our bubblegum colors post-world war one and we get into the the beautiful pieces of 30s fabrics that we love that are so bright and cheerful and again bubblegum pinky and uh powdery blue and that really does tell its own story where where was this person getting these things where might they be indicated from um and 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 what are they enjoying about those colors and choices so here's a great story about color and and understanding the maker. These are both made by the same person, um, likely Mississippi. And we know that it's definitely going to be a Southern tone because of the triple bars on the outside, as we've talked about, and the fact that they're using this cheddar, they're using this oxblood color, and they're using this teal color, three colors that were very, very popular in Southern quilting. So we do have that as a fact that we do know these are Southern. Um, we know that they're related because the same fabrics are used in both quilts. Had I not done some close-up research on these pieces, I might not have known that, but it still does attribute to me the relationship because they're both around the same time. They both have the same similar borders and they have the same fabrics being cut and used in both pieces. So that's really kind of a fun thing to get down into as well. Signature quilts or autograph quilts, as some people call them. Um, these are great, and they give you such wonderful rabbit holes. And they are ubiquitous. I mean, we start seeing them in the 1840s. Uh, we see them pretty much nonstop in different form or fashion all the way through to the 50s and 60s even. And I think some of us have even done some in modern day. I know I have. Um, and you see the changes over time. You get to see all of these different names and get to research the areas. You might even be able to figure out who was the originator, what the purpose of the quilt was based off of the names and the time period and the location. Sometimes for later quilts, you might even be able to find a newspaper article where it was a fundraiser or something. But you're also telling the story of, of a family or telling the story of a community or just a whole bunch of girls that got together or even a chain letter that could have come down the pike over time. And so these are really fun if you really want to find a story with him, because even if you can't find the full story of what happened, you find a community and you find connections and you find relationships. And it's so fascinating and fun. We also find new stories every day. This quilt that's actually behind me is the quilt that's here. Uh, it literally just came in right before recording this. It's probably about 1840, 1850. But just looking at it in the pictures here, and I do apologize for the mess, it's just, I have a cluttered sewing room. Um, the fabrics are telling me that they're early because we have all of this beautiful print work design. You've got this simple painting on the green fabric, and then you have the picotage, the dotting on the brown fabric, which is super cool. 
Um, you also have that beautiful stripe of blue and, and red together, which is an earlier print. But then if you look at the bigger piece, you see this huge border on the sides and then you see the individual cutouts for where the uh, bedposts would be. The size is odd and, and, and laid out and that could be indicative of the location. It's also indicative of the fact that beds weren't standardized at the time. So this was fitting whatever bed. But as I get deeper into the fabrics, I will photograph every single piece of fabric in this quilt. I will... Um, measure it. I will look deeper into it. I'll look at the quilting designs. I'll look at the different fabrics and, and be able to tell a story within it, whether it's the time frame or the location, uh, whether it's just a really cool cross piece of the fabric that was available to this person at the time, or, you know, I don't know yet. I could maybe find initials in it or why did they cut or why did they cut those off where they did? And is is the cut at the same place or did they intentionally cut it before the quilt was finished and um, the half pieces are the same on both sides? I don't know yet. I haven't had a chance to dig in, but that's what's exciting about quilts for me is getting that picture, seeing all of these different fabrics and all of the things available to this quilter and then how she put it together and made this beautiful piece that becomes part of the story. One of the things that we at AQSG and me as a quilt historian are really impassioned about is keeping your own stories alive. Um, I talk about that first quilt in, uh, that Aunt Becky made. Uh, that's the only one that I know of that's actually labeled with Aunt Becky's name on it. Uh, and that's because I put a label on it when I went to Houston last year. Most of hers are unlabeled and it's going to be very hard as the years wear on Um to find her quilts if they end up in the wild? How can I identify them as specifically hers? How can I tell her story? And so we are very passionate about reminding people to label their quilts. So you can see a label that I made or had made for one of my quilts for the uh, actual AQSG biennial study last year, um, which is another way we tell stories in quilts here with the American Quilt, Stor uh, American Quilt Study Group. But you wanna put things like your quilt name or the pattern that was used, when it was made, who made it. And we know that you may be the, the piecer and you may pay to have somebody do a long arming thing. You want to put both names on it or just your own. That's fine. Where it was made, if there was a purpose, if it was for like a grandkid or for uh, a wedding or just because you felt like it and any other defining features. So again, on this one, it was the, the, the title, what I did with it, what it was for. Um, what I love about it is I've created my own story in there. Uh, I didn't realize that I had written biannual instead of biennial. So people are then going to be like, oh, is it every six months or was it every other year? And that's going to be kind of funny to me, even though somebody will get it in years from now and be like, well, what do you mean by that? But it's my own little unique story as part of the thing. And then you see my plague doctor who, again, goes into all my quilts. Another way that you can document your own history or the history of the quilts around you is by registering them on the Quilt Index. The quiltindex.org is really wonderful. It allows uh, those of us who like falling into stories or, or writing stories about quilts or researching the quilts that we have to have more research access. We can see the stories of your quilts here on this site. Others can search for them and we keep a long standing history of quilts for as long as we have documentation on them. It's really a great resource. And I recommend if you have your own quilts or you have an heirloom that you know a lot about to put it there because the quilt may go away someday. You may go away someday, but the index will keep it alive. Some of the resources that we recommend if you like getting lost in stories, which I hope you will at the end of, the end of this uh, presentation, uh, the American Quilt Study Group, who you're listening to today, we're awesome. Come join us. We love researching quilts. If you love researching quilts too, come play with us. Again, the Quilt Index has a whole lot of other stuff, not just quilts, but stories, articles, ephemera, even some of the writings of the American Quilt Study Group. Uh, going to museums. So many museums and historical societies and, and historical sites have quilts and they love to get them out and talk about them with you. 
So definitely go support them and dig further into stories there. And if you're researching a family, if you're researching a name on a quilt or a whole host of names, Ancestry.com, Roots Web, all of those places uh, are available to you to get um, that information. Now, I've also included a bibliography and a thank you page for the end of this presentation that'll come up here in a moment, uh, just to give you some places to start on fabric dating, uh, reading stories about different quilts in the regions, um, and other really fun things to help you really get lost in stories. And I hope that uh, I hear your story soon and that you continue to share ours. Have a great day. The American Quilt Study Group, AQSG, connects quilt enthusiasts through research and community. We study, collect, and enjoy textiles ranging from the earliest quilt fragments to studio art and modern quilts as we discover the histories, the stories, and the meanings of these quilts across time. We meet in person and virtually throughout the year offering our members multiple ways to connect with others sharing similar interests. Our network is unparalleled. We're always excited to welcome new quilt enthusiasts to our group. Please visit AmericanQuiltStudyGroup.org to learn more. We hope to see you soon. Thanks for watching.